Hello, everybody. Good evening. We're going to get started. Um, my name is Maria Nicanor. I'm the director here at Cooper Hewitt. I'm very excited to welcome you all tonight for, for this panel and conversation on collecting. Um, the conversation tonight is in conjunction with the show that we have upstairs, which hopefully you have seen, acquired, shaping the National Design Collection. is also part of New York City by Design, which I guess is touching uh, its end tomorrow officially. Uh, I think it's going to be a week, but it's felt like a long month of design activities. Um, we're putting sort of like an, an end to it um, with this conversation as well. And, um, and yes, we have uh, an exceptional group of experts today, um, and we're going to dive deep into the psychology of, uh, of collecting, of why we collect things, both from a personal perspective, but also from an institutional point, point of view. And I, I think it's not just only the, this desire of possessing that sometimes moves us to our collecting habits, whichever they might be, right? There's also sort of like an, an interest in trying to grasp a better understanding of the world and an impulse to try to organize it. Um, we always want to try and, and understand value systems by collecting as well. And we uh, use it as a way of, of critiquing the built environment around us in a, in a variety of ways. So um, we're, we're looking forward to talking about all of that. Uh, and to do that, we have both uh, I would say uh, independent collectors, we have institutional collectors, different points of view in the panel today. All of them will be moderated by our dear friend Yang No, who is here with us tonight and will introduce you to all of our, uh, our speakers in a moment. Um, and just a few words about uh, Yang, who is a dear friend of, of Cooper Hewitt. Uh, Yang is the founder and the editor-in-chief of August magazine, which is a biannual print journal on travel and design. He was also the creative director and senior architecture and design editor at Rizzoli International Publications in New York, and uh, is also the author of several books, including Bent Ply, A History of 20th Century Plywood Furniture, and the forthcoming Knife, Fork, Spoon, A History of Modernist, Modernist Cutlery Design. Young himself is a collector, an avid collector himself, and I, I hope you will tell us a little bit about that um, tonight and where you keep all of your stuff in the city. Um, <laughs> Young is, uh, he was the chair of our National Design Awards last year and also lucky as a part of our collections committee at the museum. So with that, please join me in welcoming Young and our group of speakers. Thank you so much, Marina, um, and thank you to you and to the Cooper Unit for having all of this here for this very, I hope, very interesting conversation. And it's interesting that you you said that this is going to be about the psychology of collecting. Um, I was in Europe for three weeks last month, and I came back with four mailboxes as well as a very big suitcase that I bought and <laughs> to bring back some stuff that I found in Europe. And I was like, maybe I should spend this money on a therapist instead <laughs> of So um, maybe I have four therapists here on, on board to, to help me talk this through. So, so I'm maybe or a poor patient. So let me introduce them to you very quickly. Um, their bios is on the website, but you know it's um, uh, first all the way to my left here is Alexander Cunningham Cameron. She's a curator of contemporary design and the Heinz the Hinds Secretarial Scholar here at the Cooper Hewitt. Um, Alexandra organized the award-winning Willie Smith Sweet Couture Exhibition of 2020. And the British Nigerian design uh, designer Duro Olawu selects in 2022. Um, the dapper gentleman in the middle here is Chris Fallick. Chris is um, a board member of First Round Capital, a seed stage technology venture capital firm, where he's led the investment in Roblox, Ring, Warby Parker and dozens of other startups. Up, start um, Chris has almost 40 years of technology industry experience from helping launch TED Talks to early internet companies like eBay, which one of my problems is. Well. <laughs> uh, Chris recently joined the Coopie Hewitt Board of Trustees you know, this year, actually, and he's an avid vintage technology collector. That's interesting to me. So, um, next to me is Iris Moon, who's an associate curator of European Sculpture and Decorative Arts Department at the Met. 
where she's responsible for European ceramics and glass. She is currently planning an exhibition on Chinoiserie, which will open in 2025, entitled Monstrous Beauty, a feminist revision of Chinoiserie. I can't wait to hear more about that. Uh, in addition to curatorial work, she teaches at the Cooper Union. And then that young man over there is Patrick Parrish. He's the eye behind the popular blog and Instagram feed, Monda Blogo. He's known for exhibiting works by unusual, new, and sometimes overlooked designers and artists of the 20th and 21st century at his galleries in New York here for the last 25 years. Uh, Patrick has produced Carl Albach, The Workshop, which is a monograph of one of his favorite designers, one of mine as well, 2013. And he's the author of The Hunt, Navigating the World of Art and Design which came out in 2018. We have two very, very interesting curators from very different museums with different um, collecting um, agendas or, or philosophies, and then we have two collectors that also have very different agendas. So I think we could have a really pretty interesting discussion. But I would like to start with, first with Alexandra. Um, what happened was um, when I was first introduced to these guys, uh, by email um, several weeks ago, I, I asked them each a question about their collecting habits or their collecting philosophy. And I actually been posting those answers on Instagram stories to kind of get the discussion going. And we're, when we get to each of them, we're, I'll bring up that question and get them to give you the answer. But um, I didn't do that with Alexandra. Uh, for some reason, it was meant to go today. To put me on the and spot right now. There we go. So <laughs> you're first up. Um, as a curator here, Alexandra, a museum that has um, over 200,000 items, I think the, the number is unknown. It's somewhere 215 to 250. It's, my, it's what my, I've read in different um, sources. You have an exhibition up right now called Acquired, um, and you were responsible for shepherding a couple of major pieces in that exhibition, uh, two chairs, I think. Um, is there one piece in there that you feel like this needs to come into the collection because it filled this particular gap that we have in the collection? Well, there, there's so much strategy behind those decisions. I hope all of you who um, might not have yet seen the acquired show upstairs have a chance to look at it because I, I think it does reveal the psychology and also, you know, the strategy of if you look at the credit wall, I mean, every curator's name is on there. Um, it, you know, aside from the curators who co-curated the actual exhibition, um, and. You know, it, it's really intended, I think, to ultimately show the complexity of design history and and um, and discourse. Um, and so, uh, it's hard to choose just one. <laughs> but I think we are we are hoping to really reveal as much as possible, um, you know, diverse design stories. And, and one that really resonated with me is the story of the, the honeycomb lamb, which is in the exhibition. And it's designed 1960 by a designer in her 90s, Lucia de Respinus, for George Nelson, famous industrial design company. And this lamp, you know, has lived in many interiors. It's, it's something that you all might have seen at some point. Um, and you know the name George Nelson, but you don't know the name Lucia de Respinus, maybe, although she is, I mean, a, a multi-talented designer who designed one of the most iconic logos from a US designer. Does anyone know? Related to the food industry? <coughs> no? The Dunkin' Donuts logo. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, the Duncan note. So, you know, someone who is a part of our life. And when we saw this lamp at auction, which is one of the ways that, you know, museums acquire work through donation, through purchase, from galleries or collectors, 
um, at auction. We knew that we needed to have it because it opened up a completely different way of talking about how design firms operate, how design is a collaborative venture, how, you know, even though a company might be named after you know, one person, there are incredible teams of designers who, you know, at the time, I think Lucia was also asked to answer phones in the office because she was the only female designer there. And, and so it represents, you know, how far we've come. I mean, there's still a lot of work to do, um, but also opens up a very different conversation, um, in this case, about, you know, American industrial design history and I think we feel really privileged to be able to also put it on view in, in her lifetime. You know, someone who's been a professor at Parsons and has also, um, sorry, Pratt, and has educated generations of designers. Uh, so celebrating, you know, those types of design stories, um, I think really turns us on. For sure. Um... The name is new to me. Uh, you, you know, your interest in mid-century modern design, especially American design, and then George Nelson, of course, looms very large. Um, and if you were buying this stuff, and I think Patrick can attest to this in the '80s or '90s, you assume this guy George Nelson designed it all. And then it wasn't until maybe 15 years ago that names like um, Irving Harper or John Pyle start coming out. And these guys, you know, I think it's a, George has passed away, but Irving is still around, and he's like, no, I did that, I did that, and so forth. And so, how did you guys find out that it was designed by Lucia versus, um, you know, some un, some unnamed person? Um, well, I had seen a version of the lamp at an exhibition that happened during um, NYC by Design Europe Design Week uh, a few years ago. And I recognized the form, but it was an exhibition that was dedicated to women designers, and her name was underneath it. I was like, what? You know, maybe is this misattributed? What's going on? And and so I, you know, I started doing a little bit of digging um, and spoke to the gallerists who um, had lent the lamp to the exhibition, I did some digging online. Uh, found incredible interviews with her. You know, she's not unknown, and um, and and you know, quite a quite a hero, I think, in the New York design community, because as an educator, she's touched so many lives. Um, and even you know, at some point, we posted the lamp uh, on on Instagram, and I started getting all of these messages of like, oh my god, she was my teacher. You know, like she's incredible. Yeah, she only stopped teaching right at the. Um, when we when they moved to Zoom during the pandemic, she's like, I'm out, <laughs> and I'm I'm done. Um, and so you know, like through conversations, spoke to a mutual friend of ours, you know, who I saw had sold one of the lamps in a previous auction. You know, it, re it really takes a village. <laughs> there's there's very rarely a direct line, you know, where you'll see something and you know the like pleasure center of your brain lights up. Where you're like, oh, this is the thing, or this is special. Um, you really need to use all of the resources at your disposal to try to verify something, understand the history, check into archives. You know, I reached out to the to the Nelson archive to ask if they had any images because they didn't know when it was from. You know, and so really, we learned a lot about this particular piece and Lucia, um, you know, which is now part of you know the National Design Museum's collection and has a, a completely different story related to the object. Uh, right before we came on stage, we were in the back room talking about one of the topics we were talking about was um, how much of certain collections have been digitized and it's online for ordinary folks like ourselves to actually do research, just do Google a name or just look for reverse, you know, do the Google uh, reverse image search to see if you can find something. And, you know, it's it's obviously these, these um, archives or these um, um, databases are getting better and better, but still not everything is online, right? And uh, when I was talking to Patrick about this talk, you know, um, we, we were just talking about how often each of us have to go back to our own 
physical library books to look at the name and to see if we can find something similar, even a order of picture of a group exhibition or something like that, and say, oh yeah, that looks like it could be it. So I want to ask you, Patrick, um, you, you are a collector, you are also a dealer, meaning you, you buy and you sell. And the question I had for, for Patrick was, um, have you bought something recently with the eye for resale versus just for yourself? And um, I want to just hear that answer, but I want to follow up with, with the idea of finding things that are not um, recognizable and identified. Yeah, I, I've always books and magazines, and it, for me it was magazines because I could afford those more than books, and you know, going to art school, and I, there's, if you look at my library, there's a gap of the poor student years when I didn't buy books, and there's also, um, when you see a soft cover, you know, that I, that was during my student years, and now I look back, oh, I'd only bought the hard, hard cover, you know, they were 10 times more, but um, I recently had an opportunity, I closed my gallery up to 20, my, gallery after 25 years and Patrick Bear's gallery and I moved to a studio and it was the the auction house really wanted the library and libraries have been doing very well and someone we've talked about before Mark McDonald's library like went four times over the it just yeah I love the internet and I love using the tools and figuring out tricks to find things but it's the books and especially magazines and especially like interiors magazine the quality is so low that no one is going to scan it to put it online because it would look terrible. So you can find amazing things in these kind of low quality magazines that are fine for identifying things, but not so much for someone to spend the money to read, like Domus, very uh, Italian design magazine. You know, that, that reprint is beautiful because the photos were beautiful and the magazine was beautifully designed, but interiors holds as much or more information, but no one is taking the time to digitize it because it's just too poor quality. I mean, it's what we call, still call ephemera, you know, things, paper stuff that it's not supposed to last. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it, it was a trade publication. It's a trade publication. It's meant to last for you to order off or see some names and, yeah. and contact the, the manufacturer or something like that. Absolutely. But you find stuff. You do. It, that's it's a great resource. Um, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of space. But yes, magazines are, I think, a great kind of still untapped, a little bit um, source of, of obscure knowledge because everyone knows what's you know it, everything is already out there. So um, it's it's hard to find a source where you can't um, where it's not easy. So other than interiors, magazine with other ones. <laughs> I was just looking today, I was looking to old Craft Horizons, oh, Ceramics Monthly, yeah. uh, the uh, Walker Art Centers, their design quarterlies are unbelievable. Um, there's just, there's a lot, I mean, I could keep keep right. going. And there's a million Italian design magazines that they're very hard to find here, but right. lots of information. And as, um, you know, as a buyer of design where you, you know, I mean, you, you haunt every place from the fancy auction houses all the way to the flea market, and probably more on the flea market, it's weekly. Yeah. Um, I've kind of, when people say, where do you find your stuff? I was like, from the side of the road to <laughs> Christie's and Sotheby's. Buying and selling used books and movies and games. And at eBay, for you know much of the six years I was there, I ran the books category, the movies category, the music category. My favorite thing was to go to the Strand or Powell's Books and go to the rare and antiquarian part. So I have a little collection around that. But the tech stuff is what I really like. And I, I uh, you know, was asked as part of this, like, did you ever buy anything you regret? And yeah, my most recent purchase, in fact, <laughs> which I'll show you. But first I'll show you like a bookend of my career. And I was born in 1962. And when I went to college in 1980, I took a computer course. Anyone know what this is? Yeah. Punch card. It was my first interaction with a computer. It was a mainframe computer in another room, and you had to wait, you know, overnight for the, it to print out the reports. If it was wrong, you had to do it again. If you dropped the cards, you had to reorder them. It was really a pain. But then the personal computer came out, and I got to play with those. And my first job was selling those, 
and for a decade I, I sold the first computers. And then we saw the internet happen. We got to see that front, front close and personal. I joined a startup, Half.com. We got acquired by eBay, but I saw a lot of companies built and got the power of that pretty quickly. Uh, I was investing in companies when mobile came around, when the first iPhone got, got released. That was a pretty big deal. And the big deal right now is AI. You're probably all hearing about it, and, and uh, that, that relates to my latest purchase which is a regret, but I have it. I like this show and tell, this is great. It is. This is a humane AI pen, which I heard one laughter, it sounded like Seth Godin, I was in the back there. And I saw my son show me the review on uh, YouTube. Yeah, so the, before it came in, the reviews were pretty bad. Uh, but I was still excited to get it because I knew it would Can you do what well, it's to do well. well in my museum of failure, which I have to say <laughs> is a part of it. But uh, this is a mobile portable artificial intelligence device a companion that has a magnet on the back and it clips on your clothing. That's the design. And it's supposed to be sitting here the whole time, turned on, waiting for you to talk to it and interact and take pictures and record everything that's going on. That's kind of creepy on one hand for sure, but it could be useful perhaps if it worked well. It doesn't, that's the problem. <laughs> it, it got a horrible review by a, a famous uh, tech reviewer now, now named Mar Marquez Brownlee, who's probably as good as it gets in that world, and he trashed it, he said it didn't even deserve to be out. But that makes it more interesting to me. And. Uh, you know, maybe someday it will be here at the museum if they'd like it. But, but I love what it tried to do. And again, a thing, a thing I, I look for in in technology is uh, what what it's it's to steal a quote from a, a management author named Peter Drucker. They said, "How do you see the future?" He said, "I look for what what is visible but not yet seen, and I find it just fascinating to look at products." over time and what they represented or what they thought the world was going to be like and then what ended up happening. A perfect example of me, I collect old CD-ROMs. The round CD-ROMs wow. that had computer programs on them and I have books of them and you can flip them. There's shareware and there's games and there's programs. And we thought that was the be all end all. We thought that was the best thing you could stuff every picture of every item in this museum. You could have encyclopedias. We thought it was great. We didn't see the internet was right around the corner and basically wiped that whole world out. So that, those are the things I look for. What was the first piece of so-called technology you collected? Things that I had, like I had a Macintosh. Um, sold them in 1984. So a lot of things I just had personal use. Got it. And I, and I probably didn't start acquiring things until I was at eBay that would look for things. And for, in, 2002 or three, I lived in, in California for a few years. And it's a funny story because collecting computers was just becoming a thing then. And I told my wife once, hey, look, there's this Apple One computer coming up for auction. And I think I can get it for about $15,000. And she said, are you crazy? Are you gonna buy an old, not working piece of tech for $15,000? Well, they peaked at about a million dollars each. They go for about a half a million now. But like the, every time one sells, my friends send me articles and I show it to my wife. <laughs> That's a hot tip, everyone. Um, you, get, you know, what's interesting to me about collecting technology is you think they're so ubiquitous and so recent that you don't think about a need to find one for a collection, whether it's a museum or personally, right? Well, the thing that's changed recently is there's more verticalized uh, auction houses and sales and Sotheby's does them and Christie's and RR auction and others. And, and new categories emerge, which is new in box, an unopened first generation iPhone could go for fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000, which I think is crazy. I have no interest in it. I don't even keep boxes. There's a whole group of people that you keep the box I, perfect. I boxes, right? You keep the box. <laughs> but the, the whole point is everyone decides what is interesting to them, right? and they create that world and that and that limitation on it, and they don't care about 
what's outside of it. No, I, I last year I was helping a friend at a museum that was looking for at the very first um, Macintosh, and I thought it would be super easy. But to find one that's in decent condition, when I've been saying like brand new condition or NIB new in box, it, it, you can't, it's not like, you know, it's, there's four on eBay, there isn't. Same with the first iPhone, I, I was looking for that. Um, I need one in the box, I just want one that beat not beat up like the mine I have, and you can't find it. So is that what you would recommend museums do as, as soon as a piece of technology comes out? No. <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think I think you wait. It's an interesting thing of collecting and, and uh, again working at eBay and having other interests around music and vinyl records and other things. I, I see a lot of collectors amass incredible collections, and there is no interest at all from their family or spouse to do anything with it, <laughs> and it will go out into the ether or be sold at an auction. Like it. It has this incredible value all together in their mind. Call your wife. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm in the process of, you know, deaccessioning or whatever the the term is, um, oh. consciously to, you know, try to have it be right. Well, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's like playing the market. You don't know what something is going to be valuable, <laughs> you know, 20 years from now or not. Yeah, and and things that are like interesting and valuable to me are maybe not to other. Other, um, you know, it, it's not the dollar value. It, it's and, sure. And, uh, and so, I'm I'm happy to let it go to a place where it gets appreciated and seen. Mm -hmm. um, the Koopy Hewitt would like first in space. <laughs> yeah, well, open to that. All right. um, Iris, I imagine that the, the idea of uh, and paint on the back side of the mirror. So any part that was sort of transparent and not mirrored is actually what you're seeing. Um, in terms of, the the, yeah, yeah, through the glass. Um, and I also, I found it interesting too that all of us, even though we work with objects, we collect objects, there's always a library sort of hovering nearby. And, and of course, you know, I didn't know what I was looking at until I actually started reading about chinoiserie and, and these really strange kind of interesting pieces. Um, Can we take a sidebar and talk about that? What is chinoiserie and what is this exhibition you're working on? Sure, so chinoiserie is kind of a blanket term that was actually established in the 19th century, but refers to sort of Europe's obsession with the East. And primarily it's kind of everything you think about, you know, the sort of over the top decoration and imitation of Chinese design, whether that's porcelain um, with Japanese Chinese um, inspired decoration or actually from China or Japan to the lacquer screens you know, the wallpaper, it's all this kind of fantasy projection of a Far East that's never quite there. Um, but it's all part of a kind of imaginary site. And, you know, part of that kind of matrix of um, fantasy is always this idea of a kind of ideal beauty figure, this sort of racialized ideal beauty. And um, it's always there, but it's never talked about. And so I was kind of interested in, um, there was actually an article written by Aileen Kwan, and El Decor, where she kind of asked, is it time to rethink Shinwazari? And I just found it such a compelling kind of question because, you know, one of the quotes was, Shinwazari is nostalgic, but who and what is it nostalgic for? So the kind of question of who, right, thinking about how it relates to who we are, um, who people were in the past, I, I found really compelling. So for me, and this kind of segues back to the mirror, what I didn't mention was on the, well, on the back of the mirror, you see uh, the portrait of a woman in Manchu dress, and she is, you know, she has sort of this very elaborate costume, the ermine cape, and she's doing this kind of crazy, it's not a gang sign, but it's sort of a, <laughs> sort of a gang sign. But she's smoking a pipe, um, and then she's sort of touching her jacket, and behind her is a porcelain vase, which of course is not in real space, it's all kind of imaginary, and that, sense of illusionistic space was used as a way to prompt a language of desire in the viewer, um, not only for pieces made for the Western market, but actually in Qing China as well. But for me, what was so interesting, and Chris, it's interesting hearing you talk about technology, is that actually mirrors were a form of technology, right? Um, especially since they didn't know how to make 
plate glass big enough to cover architectural spaces until the late 17th century. So you're essentially looking at a piece of technology. And the only reason I sort of um, talk about that is because I was in the storeroom probably a late Monday night <laughs> before dumpster diving on the Upper East Side. <laughs> Um, I was sort of in the storeroom looking at this and trying to photograph it, and there was a really strong light, um, and I just got really frustrated because I couldn't quite capture the reflective surface of the mirror. Um, you know, sort of using every angle I could, and and then I was kind of shocked because I realized, like, oh, there's another woman there, and it was me. <laughs> and, <laughs> And so I, 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 sort of, I sort of had this moment where I was like, oh, mirrors are technologies. And this kind of upends everything we thought about chinoiserie as being this decorative, superficial, right? It's things that only women collected and were interested in because actually it does prompt you to reflect on who you are and kind of who you are in relationship to this woman who's already there. Um, and not only is she already there, she doesn't look anything like you, or maybe she does. And... Um, I just I found it really fascinating to sort of think about that and that sense of encounter and the sense of immediacy and how objects can kind of prompt all these sorts of ideas that sometimes aren't in the textbooks that you read about Shemaldry. Right. You said, yeah, you said the picture of the piece, but in order to photograph it, uh, for us to see the mirror effect is not there. So you think it's actually a great background when in fact, this piece must be very um, interactive. Absolutely. And the other thing I found so funny is that, you know, we have lots of chinoiserie porcelain um, from Meissen, from many different manufacturers. But this is really the only example of chinoiserie that kind of looks back at you. Um, and I also realized, too, when I, when I saw myself, I was kind of forced to pivot to the side because she was already occupying so much mm -hmm. space. And it was literally this figure that was kind of rendering the mirroring obsolete because she was covering a lot of it. And so, it, I mean, it sort of brought into play all sorts of ideas about, you know, a reflective space that you expect to see yourself in, but it's already being occupied by someone else. Um, and the kind of idea of projections and fantasies, and then we can get to psychoanalysis, psychology if you want. But um, then it was really, yeah, it was really kind of, kind of deep. Do you think the reflection aspect is, is um, intentional on the artist's part? Yes, so we do have accounts by Jesuit, French Jesuit um, missionaries who are in China. I think his name is Brother Atire, and he describes the effect, this ex extraordinary effect. Um, we're, we're stopping time in a way. You know, we have the responsibility to try to preserve it in the condition that it's in, or, you know, improve that condition and make sure that it's, um, going to, and this is a big question with technology, right? How do you collect technology that, you know, is immediately obsolete as soon as you have it, if you want to put it on view 50 years from now to show how it works? Um, and, and so the conservators, you know, we all have incredible teams of conservators who are really caring for the objects. Um, and, and, you know, curators, the role of curators, which I think has shifted over time, has really become more about creating that connection between, you know, the objects and and people, right? Which is which is opposed to, you know, trying to put it in a sensory deprivation chamber, which we have to do with with some objects, you know, make sure it's climate controlled, protected, you know, hidden from the light. And so we have so many, um, you know, best practices and parameters around putting these objects on view in a way that protects them, but also you know, connects them in some way to the public. You know, they have to be under a vitrine, the light levels have to be low, you know, they have to be within three feet touch distance. If they're, you know, it's not like this at, at every museum, but Smithsonian institutions, you know, have, have extremely rigorous um, display parameters around objects. And, I mean, speaking, speaking of some of the objects in Acquired, for example, um, there's an incredible chair um, that was made for us by the designer J. C. Jung O, oh. and um, it's you know an es it's it's a really like a collage an assemblage of objects that she collected over time so during the pandemic, which was a you know an incredibly 
um, a complicated time for many people, and you know the things in their lives took on completely different meanings. I'm sure you all can relate to that. Um, so she assembled these objects, which sort of creates almost like an abstracted self-portrait, and, and wrap them in in raw leather cord. And the first thing she said to us when you know the the chair arrived is, "Oh, but I, you know, it's important actually that you see." Uh, the human touch on this chair. You know, I love that when people live with them, you can begin to see, you know, the color shift where a hand goes or an elbow goes, and, you know, they sort of take on the, the postures of their users. How, how can we do that with you? <laughs> and, um, you know, like, 30 meetings later and, <laughs> you know, like many, I mean, we really, you know, we have these conversations that um, force us, you know, triggered, of course, by artists and designers that force us to reevaluate, you know, what, what care actually means. Um, and, you know, so we ended up uh, getting a touch sample. Jay made us a touch sample. So at least, you know, people would be able to feel the texture because that, tactile element of, of the chair was really essential to the experience of it. Um, but you you know, you can't, like, it, there's never a, a completely right answer, I think, and that, and that dialogue continues to evolve. You know, I'm sure you have the same type of experience. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think definitely touch, I mean, that is what makes being a curator special, is that you can actually get the thing out of the vitrine and, and handle it. And, um, but I, I do think, too, that looking, active looking, shouldn't be completely discredited. Uh, I've been watching John Wilson, How To With John Wilson, HBO. It's pretty amazing. Um, but the reason why I mention that is he does love trash. He's also a dumpster diver. <laughs> and after I saw that show, I, the streets looked different because I was looking at them differently, right? You were looking for the weird little glimmering thing in the corner, right, next to the weird liquid on the ground, that's probably, I don't know what it is. Um, and that's why gloves are for <laughs> conservative gloves. That's a good point. <laughs> um, but, but I do think active looking can prompt something akin to touching. Uh, and also, I like being able to write a label that makes someone look twice. Um, there's a case across from, I think it's the hottest real estate at the Met, it's across from the bathrooms. Um, the Reitzman bathrooms, and we put up a 19th century palissy ware display, and there are all these kinds of snakes on a plate and frogs and all sorts of things. But you know, as soon as you go out of the bathroom, you're sort of waiting for your other person, and you're sort of, but they sort of stop you in your tracks. And I like that sort of the initial visual encounter then draws you in to read the label, and then you look again. So I, I do think it's a kind of coordinated process of the text prompting the person to look closely. Um, and, and I do think that there's a kind of magic there. I mean, I, I really appreciate the sort of anatomy of a label that Cooper Hewitt has here, where you're sort of like, oh, well, what's an accession number? What's this? What's that? And once you know how to sort of read that label, you understand how much information there is about, about the object. But I, yeah, I definitely think looking is good. Made me think of a, uh, a visit I did on Friday to one of uh, the, the larger major computer museums, computer history museums in the country. There's probably five or six computer history museums, the most famous, the biggest in uh, California used to be on the board of that. Uh, there's one in Atlanta. Expands and grows. Yeah, and to pull back a bit on that, in order for software and these websites like this, you need the hardware to present them on. So is that part of the collecting process as well? Yeah, we have um, an incredible conservation team that is really, um, you know, getting down and dirty with all of the questions around how to collect digital content. And you're probably more of an expert on this than I am. I'll, I know an example that uh, Andrea was working on a day that I was here, and it, and it had to do with... Um, a new artist you you collected that had to do with the computer virus. I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about, but oh, this is the Tobias Wong. Yeah, the which I was blown away with 
how interesting that word all was. Uh, my favorite was a business card that all it said was, I'll call you. And you hand it to someone. <laughs> he was but, hilarious <laughs> and brilliant. <laughs> oh, really? I'd love to know more. But uh, he had something that had to do with images around a, uh, a computer virus. And there was actual software with a real computer virus in it. And Andrew and the team went down to Smithsonian in DC and with forensic experts from the Smithsonian in a, you know, a walled off air gapped room as they call it, like they let the virus loose on the computer to capture it and had video going to watch how it attacked and you know probably killed this computer. Yeah, it was in a safe environment. In a safe it's room, yes. To any servers which, and, which I thought was yeah. really, really cool. And again, one of my favorite pieces I'll never give away until I'm gone is uh, an artist created a, a fake but real. They had a fake artist and they said, this computer contains the six deadliest computer viruses ever created, and I have one. And I keep, and I keep it under glass, just to make it's, it's, it's a CDC of... Uh, Pretty much, yeah. It's got everything that you would hate to ever have in the real world. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, but I want to ask you, Patrick, do you all have any of these problems when you collect things, objects? Yeah, I mean... I mean, if conservation problems and restoration. What do you, what do you do and what don't you do? And books you do have the eight year old is is he not allowed to touch through? No, he's he's only broken one thing ever, and he was in a in the whatever you call a baby Bjorn, and he reached over my shoulder, tried to grab my keys, and he grabbed the um, Arabia Kajfrank dish. I know who's. Um, Stig Lindbergh dish, the checkerboard one, yeah. and broke it. We still have it, but it was, you know, Clyde um, roams free and is as big or bigger collector than Alex and I are. <laughs> but uh, what, 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 pro what everyday problem you encounter when you live with stuff? At, at home or at the studio? No, at no. home, at home. Um, dusting? No. <laughs> I don't know. You know, sunlight, which I used to be super, super duper um, afraid of, and I... For books, for sure. Well, for books, um, yes, but for objects and paintings and textiles and, and our apartment faces south and there's a lot of windows. So, but I, I, I kind of hesitate to say this with this crowd, but I've kind of gotten over that because it's in our house and it's not for sale and it's maybe one day it will be and we, we're not abusing it right. but i like sometimes i like to see light on that painting or, or light on that textile and uh there's nothing really blasting it but it it you see the effects i mean you do. so you don't keep your lights at 15 units or no no <laughs> there's no yeah, there's no temperature no control. i i think my rule is like if you think you're gonna break it and you, you should get rid of it, sell it, put it in storage. <laughs> no, I mean, what's the point of living with something that you're fearing the whole time, right? That it might break. Yeah, I, I don't know, I handle stuff all the time, and like I said, Clyde is very responsible, so it's, um, and so is my wife, but, um, you know, you, if, yeah, if you do, I, I agree, if I felt, I've, we've had stuff that I'm like, I no, don't feel comfortable with it, and it usually gets sold. Uh, I think we have maybe 10 minutes left, so we're going to open it up to questions from the audience, and maybe you guys have some stories about collecting as well. Um, uh, I think someone's going to come around with microphones. Oh, I can. I can. I can. Okay. What, 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 we appreciate what, if you'd use the microphone, thank you. Is, what have you found in the dumpster? <laughs> <laughs> you, who are you asking? Is that Ricky Clifton? Of course it's a Ricky That's my dad, actually. Which, who are you asking, Ricky? Because, you know. Everybody. Everybody <laughs> keeps talking about dumpster diving, and I'm just wondering what, because I, I found some nice things. What have you found, Ricky? Well, also, when I drove a cab, I found kind of stuff on the street. That was back in the day, right? Yeah, it's you crazy if you have find... wheels. Yeah. No, my, you know, I just have to say that, like, people always say, oh, do you, tra when you travel, do you always look for stuff? And I was like, it depends on where you are. <laughs> If you were in a very wealthy city like Paris or Berlin or Vienna, where there's been hundreds of years of people buying things and saving things and then throwing them out, you will find great stuff. But if you go to the Midwest, where it's farm country, you're going to find some farm equipment, but you're not going to find <laughs> amazing ceramics or, you know, or, or on a glass. 
No. Anyone else? No, I was just wanting everybody to answer. <laughs> okay. Remember, remember, um, Ricky, I'm trying to remember anything that would be memorable. I, there's a memory that sticks in my head that a dealer friend I know who was on a bus and driving down York or somewhere, and he saw a leg sticking out of a dumpster. <laughs> he got off the bus, and he ran and he pulled it out, and it was a Gustav Sickly table with a groovy, you know, inlaid tile in it. And at the time, Right now, they're not even, I mean, the, the market was super hot for this. I remember you got like $30,000 for it. And that, that always sticks in my head. I'll try to remember my best score, but um, but it, are you, does it have to be in the dumpster or can it be on the street? <laughs> yeah, whatever. I, I found a set of uh, Four Seasons restaurant, like the nut tray slash ashtrays. And those went, when, when the Four Seasons went out of business, those went for a lot of money. But that was just that. So I think na some neighbors were throwing it out. You know, that's a great thing about living in New York, especially in Brooklyn, is it's it's the Serengeti. You leave out carcasses, and <laughs> other people will pick it up immediately. You know, I mean, it never. I'm very proud to say I've never left anything that's not gone within an hour. So I found a uh, uh, if you're a monkey chair. And a construction site in Chelsea next to an outdoor toilet. Right. And, but you know, the trick here, I think the lesson here is you need to know what you're looking at. Right? No, I um, said, when I saw it, I, right. I, I mean, I you do, you know, plenty. It sort of rang a bell, so I do. <laughs> right. And wear gloves. Wear gloves, exactly. <laughs> next question. Hi. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the roles of DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations that are currently decentralizing ideas of ownership and collecting, in which thousands of people can participate and co-own, perhaps the most famous one being Constitution DAO, one and two, where they were not able to actually own a copy of the Constitution, but thousands of people raised $43 million in just a week, as well as cultural heritage preservation DAOs that are thinking about um, uh, uh, taking objects and placing them within the public as a means of making sure that they remain. How do you understand the idea of collecting and ownership as we see the rise of Web3 adjacent technologies that are really focusing on decentralizing these hierarchies? There's so many ways to answer this question. There's a technical, technological side, I imagine, yeah, so, uh, Chris. I, 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 I have been extremely interested in that idea and know every example you're referring to and have thought of and even presented to the Cooper Hewitt an idea for an object I've got that I'd be happy to donate, but I wanted to do it in a more interesting way that might combine shared ownership, quote unquote, whatever that might mean, that would encourage more people to feel connected to it and want to come and see it and visit it in person and have you have a better story to tell their friends and family when they come in. But I also think that the whole NFT world and that stuff has not played out as anyone thought it would and isn't, it, 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 it hasn't solved it as I've looked at it. But I'm still, the, the core thing you're looking for, how do you get something shared, multi-ownership multi that's still available is, is super. Um, I wonder too if the term ownership can be sort of supplemented by or put into tension with stewardship because I think ownership itself <coughs> should be put into question, right? Why is it imperative to own and to possess, right? And what would it mean to think of to steward a collection and, and you know, the issue of stewardship instead? So that's just, and just to add what, to what Maria said. Amazing. One more question, maybe two more. Um, hi, I have a question about um, how important when you are picking things is the story versus the actual artifact. And are things with known identity more or less or equally as valuable as things that just are mysterious? Um, especially when thinking about like a public collection. I think about the baseball cards and how there's an emotional attachment with that 
identity um, of the past of you know the artifacts versus a piece of old porcelain that you don't quite know where it came from. Um, yeah. I think you're going to get two very different answers, whether it's an institutional um, point of view or a private point of view, so maybe we can get one of each. Iris, do you want to take the institutional point of view? Sure. I mean, I, I can only speak to porcelain. You don't know where it's made, who, who it's made by. Um, and, and I do think this is where the question of history comes into play. Uh, we're, we're somewhat different from a place like the New York Historical Society, where they do collect artifacts and documents in addition to works of art, whereas I think traditionally the Met has prioritized the collecting of works of art, in quotations. Um, and I think, though, what that means is that um, we do have to attend to the physical, visual properties of the thing, and that it's not simply an illustration of a specific time period, right? It, it exists in tension with um, the specific historical context in which it was made. And you do have questions of intentionality, right? What was this made for and why? Who was it made for? Um, and I, I think starting with those basic questions, right? Like, when was this made? What is it made of? Who, who was it made for? And, and then you get to why. I think that's kind of how you build um, a story around the object. Um, I don't know if it's true for other museums, but we, we tend not to collect things for their market value, right? It's, it's both in relationship to our own collection, which is a collection of collections. And many of these pieces have been donated by New Yorkers um, who have a direct relationship to the Met and who feel compelled in, you know, acts of philanthropic generosity to give stuff to us. Um, and so the challenge is, how do you extract from that history of collections, right, collection of collections, and create a different kind of story? And for me, that's very interesting, and, and I think that's where you can be a little bit disruptive and a little bit, um, you can sort of revise the story in a way. Um, and, and, and objects, works of art allow you to do that which I think is great, and especially the ones where you don't know who the artist is, you know, you don't know exactly who it was made for, and so you start to build out a kind of story around that, so, but that's a great question, thank you. Patrick, how, um, how much this, uh, this story behind the object uh, comes into play when you buy something? I, I think, well, I don't think I know if it's a mass-produced object, um, you know, you can put anything in here, I'll put a watch. You know, if you have a Rolex GMT from 1965 that was owned by Neil Armstrong, the value goes up. If it flew to the moon, the value is basically priceless. priceless. And um, so the watch is exactly the same, but it's where it's like, who owned it? It's like provenance, and it's provenance. So regardless of value, someone, even with something very inexpensive, it's like, oh, you know, I mean, from my best friend on that, to my principal on that, to the college, you know, it just goes up with that. And so any collector is going to be drawn to something that has some sort of provenance. Um, if it's a known manufactured, uh, you know, industrial produced object. But then when you get into things like that are anonymous, like I deal in folk art or used to, and that's just, it's strictly visual. And, you know, but then if it came from an important collection, it goes up. And it's not necessarily about value, it's about kind of desire within the collecting community. And usually desire leads to higher prices. I'd just add a perspective that might be somewhere between, but I think the story is very important. And not necessarily the provenance of that particular watch or item, but just why is this thing interesting? Like you talked about you know, mirror painting and like that's, story is the beautiful part of that, right? I would look at it and wouldn't grasp that until I heard your story about it. I have a, a friend that has been selling records for 61 years and collecting them, and he has uh, the world's greatest collection of group harmony vocal 45 records, very specific thing, starting from about 1957 up into the late 60s. And he has 11,000 of them. And uh, we are helping him have conversations with the Smithsonian, the 
the Library of Congress, and we, we made a documentary about him, and we, we uh, uh, screened it at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame two weeks ago, and they're interested. And the thing is, it, you know, maybe there's some money he'll get from it, but it's more about where it goes, and that they get his story of it on the way out. Like, he, it, it's not in any spreadsheet, it's in his walls, and he has stories about him, and he's eight years old, and he realizes that like, he wants to get the stories captured. Why is that record interesting? Why is that one worth $10,000, even though you would hate the way it sounds, and why is this one worth different? And he wants to help, and we want to help him get the stories co collected before it finds the home. And, uh, and so I think they're important. Yeah, I think the big takeaway then is that um, it really it comes down to a personal meaning, right? Whether it's a collective personal meaning. <laughs> yeah, I know that sounds uh, weird, but if you don't have that connection to the piece, it doesn't matter how valuable it is. It's not, it's not yours in any kind of a spiritual or, you know, or, 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 or communal way, no matter what. And so, in the, in the end of the day, museum is all about storytelling, and that this is how this is connects to you as the viewer, as you know, especially at this museum, because it does belong to all of us. Uh, I think on that note, I'm just going to let anyone who has questions just to come up and maybe ask the panelists um, about it afterwards. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.